Hey guys, what's up? This is Chad Haig here in southern India. I'd like to continue the series of videos on the philosophy of Slavoj Žižek by talking today about his uh, book, In Defense of Lost Causes, and uh, specifically the final chapter of that book, which he dedicates to the topic of ecology and post-humanism. I think it's useful to um, situate Žižek uh, in relation to Pentelinkal Law, who is kind of the exact opposite of him on this topic. But I want to start by saying that if you enjoy my discussion of uh, Zizek, ecology, and technology in this video, you might be interested in my new book, The Hermeneutics of Ecological Limitation, Eco-Philosophy Beyond Environmentalism. This 250-page book of original philosophy on ecology, hermeneutics, technology, etc., um, will explore Zizek in depth along with the most controversial thinkers on the topic, like Julius Evola, Ted Kaczynski, Vark Vikernes, Penti Linkula, John Zerzon, and John Michael Greer. For a limited time only, this will be available for just under $10 on paperback and just $4 on Kindle edition. So I'll post the link in the description of this video um, in just a few days when it's published. So the final chapter of Zizek's In Defense of Lost Causes is dedicated to addressing the problem of ecological crisis, but he says that that's not really a problem in itself, so much as it's something you can only understand um, in relation to global capitalism. But for that reason, you have to have um, a willingness to think about big picture changes if you're actually going to deal with it. So Zizek included ecology um, within this book because it fit into his broader theme of trying to redeem the totalitarian spirit of big changes in an era where that's become unfashionable, even among the radical thinkers today. Zizek argues that this aversion we all have to um, thinking about um, serious changes to the system um, out of respect for the prohibition against what would be called totalitarian thinkers or thinking or engaging with the terror of um, what followed after the French Revolution, for example, that has actually just made us all into Fukuyamians in disguise. The idea that uh, global capitalism and Western democracy are the end of history, basically uh, accepted even within the social justice movement. The social justice movement has accepted that those things are here to stay, so the only task that remains is just to make it more tolerant and more politically correct and more inclusive. Um, Zizek begins, however, by claiming that ecological crises must be understood as one of the antagonisms of global capitalism. Like third world slums, they're just another of the excesses generated by the substantial base of the global capitalist system. However, ecological threat does kind of change the maybe traditional Marxist way of thinking about this because, you know, the old cliche about waiting around for the system to self-destruct itself um, through its own contradictions and flaws, like that will be good enough because it's inevitable and hardwired into capitalism anyway. Um, that's something which, for the first time in history, we're actually living in an era where um, one subjective intervention actually does have the potential to directly intervene into the historical substance through some catastrophic disturbance. For example, it's not impossible for some bio-warfare agent to escape out of a laboratory and bring about human extinction as a result of one subjective error. So the idea that subjective intervention is not only unnecessary to the inevitable collapse of capitalism, but it's actually illusory anyway. That's precisely what Zizek challenges, because he says the old phrase from, um, from Hegel, not only is substance but also subject, is more relevant now than ever before. Likewise, although um, ecological thinkers stereotypically tend to call for like renouncing human instrumental reason in favor of mimesis or some other mystical stance of reverence for the other, this is the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory idea that um, the problem of technology is precisely that it extends human subjectivity. Um, Zizek argues that that's actually wrong. What we need right now is not to renounce subjective agency, but precisely to seize it. You can look at the case of Chavez in Venezuela as an example, in that he succeeded in rebelling against the system precisely by going legit within the state rather than remaining an outsider. And he said that this fits the, um, the facts uh, in our era just as well, because um, it's precisely the big industrial polluters and the CEOs who are resisting the state, because they're the ones who are actually circumventing the formal legal regulations regarding things like um, the environment and, uh, and, and workers' rights and things like that. So we actually um, have to uh, grab power by the state if we hope to achieve a real change. 
However, Zizek has reservations about how to do ecology properly, um, given these uh, revelations. No ecological stance, he says, can be legitimate if it disregards the class struggle criteria of a Marxist rebellion against capitalism. So he says that any deep ecologist who uses ecology to legitimize the oppression of the polluting poor will be disqualified. Interestingly, Zizek seems to identify ecology as a smaller part of this broader critique of global capitalism. In other words, for him, ecology is not the objective factor itself. Um, it's really capitalism that's the problem. And we can obviously consider this in contrast with Linkola, for whom ecology is the fundamental issue, not capitalism. Linkola would show no favor in giving third world slum dwellers a free pass on their contribution to pollution. Because the economic and political issues are simply a means to an end for him to enforcing the same ecological restrictions regardless of personal bias. Zizek, on the other hand, would claim that ecology is only one of four total issues confronting us. The other ones are like intellectual property rights, new scientific developments, new forms of apartheid and walls coming up. Um, so any attempt to address ecology without respecting this broader context, Zizek says, is bound for failure. This warning, he says, is not merely hypothetical. Zizek notes that without the proper context, ecology does devolve into the engineering problem of how can we maintain sustainable development? This is how do we um, bring about green capitalism? He claims that Whole Foods and uh, Starbucks have already done just that since they have merged consumption and political activism into a single act. In other words, you don't need to feel bad about spending $5 on a cup of coffee because we assure you a fraction will go towards building schools in the third world. He says though that because ecology is a problem of antagonism, it is impossible to address it without a certain amount of terror being involved. Interestingly, Zizek argues that the difference between the attitude of fear and the willingness to confront the trembling of terror provide the true standard to determine how um, authentic one's response to all of these problems actually will be. So he says fear attempts to maintain stability against threats. Only terror openly confronts the shattering experience of negativity, which is necessary for any real change to occur. Therefore, Zizek claims that most deep ecologists are actually stuck in the mode of fear. For them, the preventing disturbances and clinging to some semblance of order and stability is the main task uh, for confronting ecological dangers. Ecology is therefore just one more means of distrusting big changes, but this just reinforces the hegemonic ideology. It's no coincidence, then, that most ecological activists uh, resist totalitarian big-picture thinking. However, something far more radical is going on than just a desperate attempt to not rock the boat too much. Zizek notes, for example, that our current trajectory is actively paving the way for none other than nature itself to disappear. Ironically, this goal is advanced precisely by encroaching upon depriving man of his status as a natural entity. He says that cracking the codes to unearth how organisms function does transform them from naturalistic mysteries into fully replicable and manipulable electronic appliances, even ones which corporations are free to come in and patent the intellectual property rights on later. So ironically enough, you have this thing which um, has existed, I guess, for millions of years of evolutionary history, product of nature, and yet if you crack the code, you can still have some asshole come in and uh, make it his own intellectual property. And paradoxically, it's precisely when nature vanishes as an impenetrable mystery like that, that man himself also ceases to exist. You can find this disappearance of nature in the way that um, John Zerzon's critique of uh, man's domination over the earth is actually somewhat out of date, far from merely seeking to control nature or clone it faithfully. Contemporary scientific projects are actually oriented towards producing something radically new. AI, for example, is not about replicating the human brain. It's about generating something altogether different and unquestionably superior. Fantasies of a new biological monster that can reproduce asexually also bring the psychoanalytic motif of the undead life one step closer to becoming a literal empirical object within the world. Shishik warns, however, that the response from mainstream ecologists is actually to just turn um, nature into a new religion by making it an unquestionable authority uh, which is free to impose limits on human subjects as necessary measures to curb their dangerous activities. This is exactly what 
um, Zizek would charge Linkolov, for example, with doing. Zizek finds this to be, however, the greatest delusion because it negates the Cartesian dimension of radically negative subjectivity by elevating nature to the uh, status of a new sacred mystery, which must never be unlocked. We can only bow down to it in pious reverence. I quote him, we are in this context, not Cartesian subjects extracted from reality. We're rather finite beings who are embedded in a biosphere, which vastly transcends our own horizon. However, Zizek claims that the real mystery for why, despite all of their calls for people to radically change the behavior to prevent collapse, the big changes um, never actually arrive, but he says this is no coincidence because this ecology is actually all about shying away from revolutionary disruptions in order to maintain some semblance of a functioning status quo. Although environmentalism is often associated with the political left, therefore, Zizek finds that it's actually an inherently conservative movement because in, in their mind, any change can only be a change for the worse. This resistance to change is, however, precisely a misunderstanding of how nature works. It's even more ironic to cite Darwin as a source for this attitude because Darwin's real point was that nature is not a static whole which must be maintained. Nature constantly improves through evolutionary adaptations. In other conference talks, Zizek has also mentioned that it's peculiar to try to defend nature against catastrophes because nature actually is the catastrophe. The fact that some 90% of human DNA is junk is evidence that um, evolution did not occur through some perfectly engineered plan. It was in itself something of a catastrophe. It was an accident and a contradiction. Likely, as Zizek mentions in this text, um, his famous quote that nature doesn't exist. Human activity is and not some extrinsic obstacle which must be eliminated to allow nature to function properly. At this point, there is quite literally no such thing as a nature without human activity. If we disappeared tomorrow, nature itself would collapse because it has fully adapted itself to all of our intrusions. Contrary to expectation, this realization that nature does not exist is uh, not the madness of a solipsist um, idealism. It is the only possible stance for someone who is actually a materialist. The true materialist accepts that nature in itself is an idealist fiction. Nature is not a whole. Likewise, Zizek openly promotes an ecology without nature. This is the only viable path forward. The irony is that the very obstacle to ecological progress, he says, is our belief that nature exists as a whole. Likewise, deep ecology uh, calls for humans to abandon their delusions of grandeur and incorporate themselves back into the life world. This misses the point entirely, since it's precisely the horizon of the common sense life world that inhibits us from taking ecological threats seriously. Shizek says, if you gaze at the sky in its immediacy, you won't actually see a hole in the ozone layer. All you'll see is a clear blue sky. You couldn't imagine that it would ever be disrupted. This retreat into natural beauty is therefore exactly the problem. Paradoxically, taking the plunge into materialism does not erase the Cartesian cogito either. Rather, the more materialized the objective body becomes, the more empty the cogito is revealed to be. Yet this void of empty subjectivity is exactly the confrontation with radical negativity which totalitarian big-picture revolution entails. Likewise, Zizek revisits Heidegger's stance on technology. Um, Heidegger showed that the biggest danger is not that some unexpected catastrophe, catastrophe will occur, which will reveal all the hopes of unbridled technologization to be false. On the contrary, Heidegger says that the real danger is that the catastrophe will not arrive and that the machine will function smoothly until the very horizon of hermeneutical openness is silently closed off forever without anyone even noticing. Even ecology has fallen prey, however, to this smooth incorporation which Heidegger warned about. Isn't recycling simply a technological project to maximize the usefulness of resources and prevent waste? Therefore, Zizek also condemns the dismissal of the coming post-human post -post universe as inherently meaningless. This is actually a very conservative way to view it because it ignores the real point that post-humanism is all about the possibility of a multitude of meanings. In fact, any aversion post-humanism which promotes withdrawal back into the natural life world will fail to solve the problem of modern technology. It's only through seizing the radical abyss of negativity that we can 
find that post-humanism provides the very outlet to liberate humans. Rather than remain stuck at the level of being symbolic plants rooted into a certain ecological milieu, technology, according to Zizek, actually allows us to embrace the subjective position of radical negativity, the true meaning, by the way, of the Cartesian cogito. I finish with this quote by him, against the background of this acceptance, we should mobilize ourselves to perform the act which will change destiny itself, and thereby insert a new possibility back into the past. So, in closing, I'd like to say that uh, you could see that for Zizek, the um, very idea of Linkolo's green police, which kind of directly embodies not the will of man to save nature, but kind of just directly embodies the will of nature itself. I mean, Linkolo's green police, who do not show favor to um, third world um, poverty, and as far as um, getting around uh, uh, pollution uh, restrictions, economic growth restrictions, as controversial as that is, and um, uh, uh, depopulation restrictions, um, is something which Zizek says, well, you can't really directly embed the will of nature into this human institution because the will of nature you're searching for effectively doesn't exist because nature doesn't exist. There is no hope of refining that will into a set of human institutions that overlap with it perfectly and eliminate human bias because the very thing you're trying to save isn't really a thing. Now, I'm not saying that I agree with that, but I do think that the zizek Linkola debate is something which um, we should be talking about more. It would certainly uh, uh, merit more videos in the future, and I'd like to hear your comments on this. Uh, just go ahead and leave your comment uh, in the uh, on this video, and we'll continue this discussion. So, thank you.